I look back all the time on that moment and uh, I feel like a very blessed and lucky man. I dreamt of that trophy in that moment a million times, but not once in my dream did I fall to my knees. A hundred thousand pound to someone like me was life changing. Thanks for joining us. A very special place for yourself. Has it been a lifelong love affair with Middlesbrough Football Club? Yeah, definitely. I think when you come from Middlesbrough, you're part of the community here, and and the football club is a, a massive part of uh, the ups and downs of the area that we live in. Um, you know, I'm a 1987 to 1990 home and away fan. I'm a real Bruce Rioch babe, and uh, you know, once you fall in love with your local club, there's you know sort of no going back and the highs and lows that we've had, you know, we, you know, I've been there through it, whether it's been via the radio or whether it's been, you know, actually at the ground, it's a, it's a real love affair. And what does it mean to you to represent Middlesbrough as a town in, in darts? There was nothing better than wearing the red and white shirt. Uh, you know, it's one of the most common questions I get and it's great to see that, you know, the photos that are synonymous to my uh, BDO career are wearing the red and white. Uh, and, and I think the, uh, the uh, Middlesbrough fans love that. Um, and I think they played sort of the part in that. You know, a lot of the dark players were really jealous of um, the support I get from sort of Teesside. And uh, I have been sort of reminded that I do mention Middlesbrough Football Club in every interview that I do. But like I said, I think if any other player from Middlesbrough, they'll be doing the same. It's just sort of in your blood a little bit. And what are the main characteristics of being from Middlesbrough that you think you take onto the hockey and sort of in your personal life as well? There's not a lot of money in Middlesbrough. Uh, you know, you, you could look at the whole of the North East. Uh, we sort of, you know, whether you're a Smoggy, a Mac, a Majordi, there's not a lot of money here. Um, but we're very community based. I, I worked in a housing organisation where, you know, it was about bringing neighbours together. It was about bringing people together. We look after our own. Uh, you know, we're very, very proud of the success uh, of individuals. And, you know, I get the feel of that sort of most days. I, I walk down the road and I'm, I'm recognised all over the place and you know you're doing the borough proud and you know that, that's the one thing that you hear so much and uh, Middlesbrough's been good to me and I, I wouldn't live anywhere else. We're going to take a trip down memory lane now to see where the, the guy from Middlesbrough you know became this international darts star so where did it all start for you where did you first get into darts? I, I was a good billiards player uh, billiards is a uh, on a 12 foot snooker table in, in them days it was two white balls and a red you, you get pots, you get in-offs, you get cannons, and uh, we created four or five world champions in Teesside. Uh, you know, Mike Russell, Dave Causier, uh, Peter Gilchrist, uh, Chris Shutt. Uh, you know, they, they were all real legends of the game. Uh, so I, I was sort of in that workman's club, even at the age of 13 or 14. Uh, and of course, when you're in a workman's club, is alongside the snooker tables, was a is a dartboard. And it was one night, uh, you know, my brother was a very good dart player, uh, arguably the best in sort of the Eston League, which a lot of the dart players grew up in. And uh, we were short one night. Uh, I remember the team being Billingham Social, uh, and I remember the double 13 I hit to uh, win the match. Uh, and once I'd hit that double, I'd never had that feeling uh, at billiards ever before. Uh, and then I was hooked. So that was around about 1985. Uh, and I went on to represent Cleveland in the British Teenage Championships in 1986 where we came the runners-up so we had quite a lot of players my age playing great darts age 16 year old. So would you say you were a natural? Definitely not. No, it's no surprise to me that you know my first title didn't come until I was 43, 44. My throw is manufactured, uh, my throw is so different even when I played in the UK Open against Terry Jenkins uh, maybe 10 years ago. It's chalk and cheese and uh, no, 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 there's no natural ability there. The success of me is you know, genuine hard work. I, I did a 40 hour week job like most people did, albeit sat in an office, but at times I practiced five, six hours a, a day and, uh, you know, and, and just honed my game and just worked on what suited me. You know what balance, what darts, and uh, but no natural talent. And as you said, it wasn't until later in life that you became, you know, on, on playing on TV and big events. So in those years before that, were you sort of working on your throw to get to that level, or were you just playing as a hobby? No, no, definitely playing as a hobby. Um, and, you know, the biggest change for me was a thing called the T side ranking events. Um, a friend called Colin Foxton, he built a, a dart easel. I went round his house. I said, "Can you build six more?" Uh, I knocked on every pub and every club door and once a month we would go into a club 
and uh, you would start at 10 o'clock in the morning you'd get 50 to 100 entrants uh, and then by five o'clock at night you will play in a final as the peak was round about uh, 2010 where we had about 400 entries for the Teesside Open so we built this fantastic ranking event series where the best of Yorkshire the best of the North East were coming together and I was winning them uh, and I just replicated that at the BDO you know you go into a, an establishment at 10 o'clock in the morning and usually you play the final round about six o'clock so what I was doing on the Teesside circuit I just did the same at the BDO and uh, you know I was age 40 when I um, started the Teesside ranking events went over to the BDO round about age 41 42 and won my first title 43 44 became a world master when I was 45 a world champion at 47 and uh, joined the PC, uh, PDC in my uh, 50th year so it's sort of been a, a, a gradual rise to the top. Yeah. And is it true that you changed darts and that had a big impact on your improvement? And I'm not a huge, you know, I started off with an Alan Glazier ton machine dart for many many years and then by chance I went to the Normanby pub and I swapped darts with somebody and it was a, a Daryl Fitton dart uh, very similar to the Eric Bristow uh, dart you know not an awful lot of difference there and you know my dart hasn't changed an awful lot um, I joined Harrow's uh, who uh, had a lot of success with Harrow's and uh, two great sets of darts with them uh, and then when I joined Target I mean that's the Nike of the athletics world is the best way to describe Target. I just love being associated with them and they've created a dart that's got me to some semi-finals now. I'm, we're working on now on a phase two dart um, but I'm just a little bit nervous to go ahead with that now because of the news of the Premier League so I used a brand new set of darts last week same darts I use so they've very much got that uh, new feeling about them now and I'm going to make a decision at the weekend do I continue with them darts now uh, or go back to the darts in 2019 so but no I've been very very lucky with uh, my dart manufacturers. So if you'd gone back to when you were 40 years old and you, you would say to you what would happen over the next 10 years yeah. I guess you wouldn't have believed it no, but what would you put it down to? It would have been laughable I wasn't even the best player in my in my Super League team we, we've got a guy called Peter Sell uh, he was my hero, um, but he was only good really at one game of darts, if that makes sense, like a Super League, a county, and he would come into a pub where I'd been in two hours and he'd have three at the board and, and beat me up, you know, 10-1, 10-2, he was that good. So there was never ever a thought in my mind that, you know, I see these 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds now and, you know, they're getting upset, but they're averaging 100. You know, I didn't have my first 100 average till I was 46 year old. You know, so I say to them, just sit tight, work hard, you know, keep believing. Um, so I, I'd have laughed, laughed in your face if you said when I was uh, first started them T-side ranking events that within nine, ten years I'd be a three-time BDO world champion, two times world master and a member of the Premier League. And what was it like lifting the trophy on the lakeside stage for the first time? The first one it was still the most incredible moment I've had in darts. I dreamt of that trophy in that moment a million times but not once in my dream did I fall to my knees. So, you know, falling to the knees and just closing my eyes, you know, for that two or three seconds there, it was just an unbelievable uh, feeling. You know, you, if you could bottle that, uh, you know, it was just the adrenaline was running through. The second one was the Mark McGinney game where, you know, he had it in his hands, I had it in mine, you know, so that was, will be remembered for the game. And the last one I felt quite at ease with Scott Waits, the, the third one, and I think I knew then that I wanted to be a PDC player. I felt like I'd done everything in the BDO then, and um, I felt quite relaxed. So, but very, very proud, very, very proud of that uh, Lakeside uh, BDO World Championship. Going into the third one that you won, it was sort of expected that not expected, but you know you were the heavy favourite going into the tournament, um, and a lot of talk about you moving to the PDC. Um, <coughs> what was it that eventually made you make the decision to move over? I would have always got the PDC. I would have worked, went after the first, you know, once you win a, a Lakeside title, you, there's nothing more really I could do in the BDO mm -hmm. apart from replicate, you know, win a World Masters again. Um, I would have gone, but £100,000 to someone like me was life changing. You know, I paid my mortgage off on year one. Year two, I was able to um, pay every bill I had, you know, and help put my daughter on the property ladder. You know, year three, you know, suddenly you've got money in the. £100,000 no one was ever taking that off me and part of winning them first three were if you win it you can't go to Q school or you give us the hundred grand back 
so it was never an option for me. Um, but out of the blue in 2018, Des Jacklin became the chairman of the BDO and he said, all people who go to the lakeside this year can go to Q School. And you know, I, I had meetings with every manager in the PDC and I was set up ready to go. And uh, by hook or by crook, somehow I got through uh, Q School and uh, I look back all the time on that moment and uh, I feel like a very blessed and lucky man. As we've just seen at Q School, the top players that go there, not, a lot of them don't win tour cards or even get near winning tour cards. So what was it like your first, ex well, first and only experience of Q School? Very tough. Uh, when you think of three days before, I'm a three times world champion. And then all of a sudden I'm putting my reputation on the line against you know, pub players, uh, Super League players, county players. Uh, you know, people from other countries, and and I didn't deal with it great. You know, your body shuts down after winning a, a lakeside title. You know, all that practice in December, all that uh, that week of just intense pressure, and then four days later, I'm expected to go in front of 350 people, and the scrutiny on me. It's only been, you know, I, I did go to Q School last week to watch, and the Fallon Sherrick uh, fever is definitely on, and it was very similar to her games. It was 10, 12 deep. Um, but it was very, very tough and uh, somehow, I guess I got through. So last January was a life-changing month for you, winning third Lakeside title and then winning uh, your talk out at Q School. Do you think that's sort of a life-changing moment that, mo that month, yeah. uh, January 2019? Yeah, it's the best month of my life. Uh, you know, three time, you know, no one can ever take them three times uh, BDO World Championships from me. Nobody can ever do that. And then to become a PDC player in the same month, it's, you know, it's what dreams are made of, you know, He's this guy, you know, entering his 50th year now and he's got this reputation at the BDO uh, and everything's on the line for him and, you know, and I'm staking that reputation. My three, D, three BDO world titles probably would have meant nothing if I'd not got through Q school or even that year one of PDC if I'm languishing in 100th position and earned nine grand on the order of merit. Where does them three lakeside titles? So I did stake everything and uh, it's so far it's worked out very well. And then of course when you did make the move there was some people saying don't fly in the PDC and others, you know, people saying you know, he's not all that, he's going to struggle but you quickly shut them up by <laughs> winning your title on your second weekend. Yeah, I, I got a lot of hate when I was in the BDO. I, was, I, I remember winning the title and you know, I, I'm a big fan of social media. You know, he's no more than a pub player. I remember one in particular tweet and it said, I think I'll go down my local boozer on a Friday night and have two hours practice and go and win Lakeside next year. Now, I had a lot worse than that. I've been called every name under the sun, but that one resonated with me the most. And I just felt like I had to go and prove, you know, what I'm really about. And I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to be the 128th best player in the world or was I going to go and climb the ranks in the PDC. So it hurt. Um, but I didn't read an awful lot of people saying he's not going to uh, do it in the PDC. I'm, I read it now. Um, I, I've got a lot of love. There's a lot of people who send me really nice things. And, um, but it is nice. It is nice because then people, I'm sure, who wrote things are now writing very nice things about me. And uh, that's what social media is all about. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, so you've got to take the highs and lows of that. Well, it has been an incredible first year. Um, would you say the highlight was probably the week in Blackpool? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you were right by my side and it was, a, it, was, it was a great video that we did and if there's one or two things, you know, if I could have gone and won it, uh, that would have just sort of been the, sort of the best mini documentary of, uh, you know, you, you picked out this guy who was making his debut and, you know, we, you interview me on the beach during the week, you interview me uh, moments after I've played each game and it could have been like a really fantastic documentary but, oh, Blackpool was awesome. Yeah, even better than Ali Pali. Uh, Extraordinary heat uh, is, is what I remember. I remember getting sunburnt with uh, Dutch TV where, similar to today, you, you hear a lot of background noises of the seagulls and, and, and they were like, we're going to have to do this again. And all of a sudden, I'm a couple of hours on the beach in the sun, the day I play Michael van Gerwen, and, and I go up like a, like a beacon, uh, red-faced, and it was just all part of what that week was about. But that's the week I felt my most special. And of course, you get another crack at that next year. Yeah. Um, but what was Ali Pali like to play at for the first time? Uh, different. The stage was enormous. Um, I'm not. The, I know I'm. I know I'm. Uh, as what people have wrote on uh, Twitter, I'm, I'm slow and I'm dull. So I didn't have the crowd rocking 
Um, and I, I did feel like my games, Fallon was following me, and you could sense that she was on next. And I even felt at times, you know, get this game over with, please, so Fallon can get on. But that suited me, you know, that suited me down to the ground. Uh, it was amazing. The crowd were sensational. It, it, just the whole professionalism of the PDC, the way you dealt with and the way you treat. And it was a remarkable experience. And uh, I went, you know, I wanted to get to the quarterfinals, and, and I did. Um, and you know, sometimes when you set yourself a target there, you've got to set yourself a target big because I felt like when I reached it, job done now. Mm. So you know, you're learning lessons all the time. And you get another go at that, of course, next year. But uh, on the back of your, your first year in the PDC, you've been selected for the Premier League. Um, were you sort of expecting the call? <clears throat> no, definitely not. No, definitely not. Um, the the, the story is quite simple there. Uh, I said to my manager, I don't want to know if I'm picked uh, because I knew they would ring him about my availability. Uh, so I went to Catrick races um, because I was pacing up and down the house. I had a feeling that Chizzy was going to get it over me. I, things went well for me. Ali Pally, you know, James Wade publicly said he didn't really want to be in the PD, in the Premier League. Mensah Sulovic got beat early doors. So I knew it was down to me and Chizzy, and Chizzy played marvellous but lost to Geoffrey De Swan. So everything was sort of going right for me. Uh, maybe Luke Humphreys, Chris Dobie, if they had ran all the way to the final. So I knew I was in with a chance, uh, but if I was a betting man, I would have said that Chizzy would have just pipped me. I was gutted when I heard it was the challengers uh, again because I thought if there was 10 players going to be picked, I would get in. Uh, so I went to Catrick Races, my manager rang me about 6 o'clock and said, look, when I had Kim Hybrids, Yella Classen in the Premier League, I'd had the call by 3 o'clock, so it's not looking good. At 5 past 7, I rang him and said, are you watching the darts? Who do you fancy here? And he said, oh, I think, uh, you know, let's hope Peter Wright wins this one. You know, it'd be great to see him win it. And he went, I just can't hold it in no longer, Glenn. I know you told me not to say anything, but you're in. He said, but obviously you can't tell anybody. So I shouted up to my wife. I said, Susan. And she, and she screamed out, whoa, as if to say, you know, I'm getting, trying to get washed here. So it doesn't matter. You know, so really I kept it to myself uh, until it came on the TV. And then obviously my phone went crazy then. And the thought of playing those big arenas, um, you know, countless, you know, Rotterdam, yeah. Berlin, how, how much does that excite you? Yeah, I, I was able to get away to Tenerife uh, after the Ali Pali, and so when you learn, you know, by your pool, you, you, self-reflection is really important to me. And uh, you know, I, I started thinking of being in Aberdeen and who am I going to play? And I, I was pretty sure I was going to be playing Chris Dobie in Newcastle, and there would have been a horde of Middlesbrough fans going to our our noisy neighbours in Newcastle there. So. I was thinking about that game an awful lot. Um, so it came out the blue when uh, I came home from Germany this weekend to find out I was playing Fallon. Uh, so that's just another massive challenge that's going to be there for me. And you know that's what the PDC and my dart career is all about. I seem to just move on to one challenge to another. And on Fallon, just a, a quick word on you know what she achieved and how much you're looking forward to playing her. Yeah, the, the whole women's darts the past six weeks has just gone. What did I, what did I, I used a word on Twitter that I think pretty much summed it up, but it's just been absolutely amazing, and rightly so. When I was in the BDO, the, the ladies' darts were more exciting than the men's. You know, I was winning an awful lot of the men's, and I was even money favourite to win Lakeside one year, whereas you couldn't pick your winner in the ladies. You know, I'm team Lisa Ashton all the way. She's my best friend in the BDO. Suzuki wins it two years running. Fallon's taken the game to a new level now. Dieter Hedman's won 130 odd titles. Trina Gulliver, the greatest player, ladies player. Lorraine wins Stanley number one. Anastasia de Bromislova, the real golden girl of you know uh, of winning the first match against Vincent van der Voort at Q School. The ladies' dart is in a fantastic position, and it probably you know quite controversially probably needed someone like the PDC to sort of market uh, what Fallon did, and it just it went crazy and. We all giggled when Billie Jean King tweeted and she was sat there on Good Morning TV. Good luck to the girl uh, and uh, I wish her all the very best. And what Lisa's done this week at Q School, ladies' dart is in great shape right now. But with that, you're going to be your opponent. You might get a bit of stick on the night, but I'm yeah. sure you're prepared for that. And you know, it's not against you. It's just they want fans to win, but maybe obviously they shouldn't boo, but yeah. you're prepared for that, aren't you? I'm saying it's just another challenge. Look, once again, controversially for me, uh, Fallon's the worst challenger. You know, if I was playing her on a, a, a pro tour, uh, you know, she'd be the one out of the nine I, I would want. Um, when you see some of the players, are, you know, the Chris Dobies, the Luke Humphreys, the Stephen Bunton, John Henderson in Aberdeen, you know, all these challenges are unbelievable. And you go to Rotterdam against Jeffrey De Swan, no thank you. 
Jermaine want to mean a no thank you. But what comes with Fallon is going to be the crowd. Uh, how do I deal with it? I've already made the decision. I'm not going to be wearing earplugs because I've not used them before. It's just a case I'll have to try and get in early, which is not my forte. I'm quite a slow starter. And I guess, you know, if worst comes to worst, you're 2-0 down. You, it's how panic sets in. But I've been called a grinder lately. You know, I, I grind out results and I do things at my pace and, and hopefully uh, my mental strength will... It's going to be a test of that. You know, my mental strength hasn't been the greatest over the years. I've had real wobbles on the uh, on the hockey. Um, it's going to be another test. And just finally, one thing you said in Blackpool um, when we were there, you said, this is my time now. And after you lost to Michael Smith, you thought, um, it's, it's no good for me to lose this game because I might not get another 20 yeah. goes at it. Yeah. And is that your attitude looking forward? You know, this is your time is now. Yeah, and, and that's the advice I give to a lot of people. I, I'm 50 year old this year. Uh, I'm not going to be in our World Masters, uh, World Match Play semi-finals for the next 10 years. That's simple. I'm retiring when I'm 55 anyway. So uh, you grab these opportunities while you can. I'm, I wish I was 20, I wish I was 30, uh, but I, I know where I am and it's no point me saying it was great experience that. I'm, I'm past that now. I've had all the experience that I've won in my life. I want to win a major title now. And, uh, you know, getting to the semi finals has given me uh, real hope that I can go all the way and do that. But um, exciting times. And you're looking at the happiest Glendurrand I've ever been in my life. We're happy watching you play. And thanks for joining us, Glenn.